Hey, how you doing, guys? <clears throat> we are live. I'm doing way better than yesterday. Yesterday I was fucking tired. I've been going to bed at 8 a.m. because I had some webinars during the night. I ate pretty badly, so I was not in the best uh, shape yesterday. Hello, PT Poyo, how are you doing? Hope you are doing well, buddy. I'm doing way better. I got some great, great news. Finally ended my negotiation. And to my big surprise, it ended very well. Let's talk about that for two minutes. Then we, why are uh, coming. But basically, I told you about this uh, negotiation I was having with some company. It went very badly at the beginning. They were like, hey, we want you full time. Okay. Uh, can you give us your salary expectation and how you are planning to work with us? Okay, I'm expecting this amount of money. Uh, I'm working this way, this way, this amount of time and stuff like that. And what they offered to me was basically, you're working full time with us. So way more time than you are usually doing every month. And we're paying you 40% less. In dollars. Plus you pay taxes. Oh, excuse me. I don't take lessons from you. How embarrassing. This was a hard no. So I was writing a message and I was about to tell him to pound sand because it was pretty insulting. Then uh, I decided to message uh, the buddy Dixon. Buddy Dixon on Discord. Shout out to you, buddy. And uh, he's very good at negotiating and stuff like that. He's very smooth when he's talking and stuff like that. He's very good at customer client and stuff like that so i sent him my message he helped me re repurpose it and re rephrase it it was very diplomatic like hey can we find a middle ground basically and what they did is that they are willing to give me three to four pieces minimum per month while still being freelance and being paid per piece as we do usually and this is the absolute best of both worlds because with three to four piece, I can live pretty decently. I can assure everything that I need financially plus save a lot of money. And I can do that with my regular amount of time. So basically, this is like full job security while remaining free and not having to comply to their shitty rules. Like, hey, when you're an employee, you have only seven days of vacations that are tied to U.S., uh important days which has nothing to do in common with friends hello kyo so it was pretty shit for seven days of vacation are you kidding me plus uh, you have to do this you have to work at night because you need to stick with pst time so it was horrible so now i'm freelance i have i'm earning more money they are paying they are paying less taxes so i will be paying taxes on my own which is a difference if i was having a salary from them or being a freelancer for them. So they are paying less taxes. I'm earning more money. I'm doing less work. Plus I'm free. So this is the absolute best of both worlds. So that's a huge, 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 huge. Huge win today and I'm pretty happy. Hope you're doing well, guys. So. Today we are talking about. The next part of Unscripted by MG DeMarco. Thank you. So, yesterday it was a pretty tough reading because we were talking basically about um, what is the script? What are the cognitive dissonance that we see from the script all the time? And how, as artists, we are exposed quite early to these. Just because we are artists, we are basically going against the mold of quote-unquote society and whatever we want we want to call it we're going against the grain so the problem with that is we basically um we basically face the script because everyone wants to get us back to the script to normal and instead of being an artist don't you want to be a vet or a doctor or an architect or work in stem or do like a real job Something like that. And we are talking at the end of the stream that every time someone is trying to bring us back to 
what they deem as normal, something breaks. Something is breaking when we are talking to them. And the problem with that is that we feel like we have lost that person. Something is different now. I was discussing with some buddies after the stream about that. And something interesting is that a mentor or a coach is also someone trying to bring you what they deem as good or normal. But the way they are doing that is generally something that hurts quite a lot. Not because they are trying to change you in something that you don't want, but because it, it hurts to question ourselves and to admit that we are fucked off. When it really, really hurts, it's not when a mentor is trying to bring you up, but when you feel that this person, by attempting to bring you back to their definition of normal, is trying to bring you down. And the difference with that is that a mentor is like, hey, this is what works. Here is the absolute proof that it works. You do whatever you want with that. You want to level up? Level up. You don't want that? You want to remain mediocre? Don't do it. But the people trying to bring us down, it's always, do you understand? I love you. I want to protect you. I don't want you to be hurt. It's always out of quote unquote love and compassion. That's why it hurts so much. That's why it hurts so much because it's someone that is supposed to be someone that loves us, basically. That we care about, that we appreciate, and such. And this is why it hurts so much. So, starting with that, wow. What happened to the stream? There was six viewers and now there's only one. What the hell is going on? Anyways. Whatever. Let's talk about the second part of Unscripted. I've talked about all the definition of the matrix. Basically, the cedars, the path of life, the, like the, the scripted playbook, the cedars, spreading the, vi the virus to hyper realities trying to keep you in the matrix basically temporal prostitution which is basically you being owned by time instead of you owning enough money to own time the life path basically the the, the middle the middle way of the slow lane the sidewalk which is basically trade tomorrow for today which is yolo i'm eating what i'm earning on the slow lane which is trade today for tomorrow in any case it's a losing path I've talked about the distraction to keep you docile and obedient. We have talked about the model citizenry, mediocre, obedient, dependent, entertained, and lifeless. And how at every stage of your life, whether it's in a relationship, with the industry, with people, and stuff like that, if you just fail on one of the different parts of the model of citizenship, mediocre, obedient, dependent, entertained, and lifeless, it's a spiral down to be entangled into the other ones. You are too entertained, you are too distracting, you are playing Overwatch or watching the next week for six hours per day. You are becoming dependent on that. So you are becoming obedient because you need your shot. You, you need your, your high thanks to that and stuff like that. You are mediocre, you need to be obedient because you have very bad results. So time's on you and you are becoming dependent on a company to bring you money. You are lifeless, that's basically the result of any of the other ones. You're too obedient, the company will make you conform too much. You will become dependent on them. We will always say yes and never say no. It's a spiral to something that is very bad. We have also talked about the definition of unscripted life, which is basically the art of you. So basically freedom from work, freedom from scarcity and fiscal constraint, freedom from hyper-reality influence, Freedom from hope and dependence, because we know that hope is a shitty plan. It's like waiting for an angel to come. And freedom from ordinary, aka mediocrity. And we've talked about the fuck this event. Which is basically when nothing else matters, you want to get out of your shitty situation. We have talked also about the threats 
to these f these events, aka mediocre comfort, your gallant pride and ego, the quote unquote high have responsibilities, and finally fear. So given all of that, all of those different tentacles trying to bring us back to what we deem as not mediocrity, but something we are not identifying with. Let's talk about how to gonna go to unplug from that and how to thrive within it. First, the book is talking about something called the unscripted entrepreneurial framework, aka Tunaf. So the first sub process is like micro process. First sub process, your micro process are your thoughts pattern, your beliefs, biases, and your ability to self reflect. It's how you think, how you feel, and how you interpret the world around you. Second sub process, it's a framework. It's a macro process. And micro processes are repeated and modified actions. The word repeated and modified are critical to result. Changing the action from an event, like a solitary action changing nothing, to a process, an action change, change everything. This is basically the compound effect in, in effect. I know this is complex, we're gonna develop that after. But basically you have your thoughts and basically your belief system, what you believe in, dictates your actions. And repeated actions Almost 200 followers. That's true. 175. Let's subscribe and follow on Twitch, please. Hello, Tassina. Hope you're doing well. So basically, if you have good actions, that's because you have good belief systems. Your fucked up belief systems will do fucked up actions and you have fucked up results. Good on you. And basically, the book is saying that we have a self-imposed prison. Beliefs, biases, and bullshit. The three Bs. Beliefs, it's basically what you think is true that necessarily isn't. Biases are your mental shortcuts and default assumptions. Either reaffirming or protecting your beliefs. And bullshit... It's your internalized narrative about why things are, or simply the bullshit you sell yourself. Let's talk about beliefs. That's the freebie is basically the main the main meat of today's menu. So belief number one, the shortcut scam. Ordinary doesn't compel extraordinary. The shortcut scam is the idea that extraordinary result can be achieved with by uncovering a secret bypass or miracle weapon and such can skirt the real hard work that actually creates the extraordinary result it's like about finding a cheat code and a lot of people you can see that in advertising all the time like doctor hey sir this grandma has a nice trick that makes you lose 30 pounds in two days or buy this miracle belt that gives you perfect abs in 10 seconds as if a $20 belt could fit in, text in 10 seconds, like 10 years of bad habits of about food and gym. It's crazy plugging those 10 years of, of work for you. No. It's like life hacks. And even though there might be ways to optimize, there's a difference between optimizing and trying to find a shortcut. And every time... Especially in art, you see someone trying to find shortcuts. They wreck themselves. Don't trust me, here is an example. I see that every year when I'm teaching. And I love those kind of students because they remind me they remind me about me when I was their age. When I was a student. I was the same. I had shitty techniques. I was searching for the shortcuts like photo bashing, 3D and stuff like that. Guess what? I didn't know how to draw. I still, I still don't really know how to draw. I know how to paint very well though. But when I arrived at Ubisoft, I was like... I don't know shit. If I don't have my 3D, if I, if I don't have my photo pack, if I don't find the perfect photo, I don't know how to do shit. And when I see a lot of students 
There is one in, in particular that I'm thinking about that I met this year. This guy has a lot of potential. He's kind of kind of decent in terms of art. He has a lot of potential for realism, like working at Naughty Dog, Ubisoft, and stuff like that already. But this guy is not working on the fundamentals. He's only working on making picture looks good. So with photo bashing, 3D stuff, like exactly like I did. The problem is that now it's normal. Six years ago, it was very uncommon to know those techniques. Now it's normal. It's a given. The problem is that now he's achieving crazy good results compared to the other students. But what he doesn't realize is that at the end of the year, other students will know those techniques, but because they have way better fundamentals than him, they will be able to close the gap super fast compared to, the, to him. And he doesn't see that he's only focused on results and not on learning first. Again, as they say in mastery, focus on learning about money or fame or stuff like that. My uncle told me a good lesson about shortcuts. It's basically teaches you bad habit and doesn't build you robust discipline. Exactly. So shortcuts is mother nature way of saying fuck you. Exactly. I have a punchline. Uh, it was uh, in one of Tim Ferriss's um, speak or TEDx. He was quoting um, a gym athlete, something like that. It was basically hard choices, easy life. Easy choices, hard life. And you can transmute that to when you are working. Hard work, easy results. Easy work, hard results. When you are cheating, when you are finding the hacks, and you are only relying on that, it will be easy work, but very hard result to achieve. You need to use the hacks. Hacks are not bad, but you need to use them once you master the fundamentals, and you can skip that, because you know it's instinctive now. So the shortcut scam is the idea that extraordinary results can be achieved by uncovering a secret bypass or a miracle weapon. As such can skirt the real hard work that actually creates extraordinary results. The process principle is an intelligence awareness that extraordinary results require an extraordinary effort consisting of daily habits, routines, and sacrifice. That's exactly why, before I talked about the 10x rules, extraordinary results require extraordinary efforts. You need to 10x the, the goal and to 10x the amount of work for that. But the counterpart to that is that you have a 10x reward hanging out in front of your face. And then we were talking about mastery and the compound effect with the power of daily habits, routine, and sacrifices. The book describes nine steps to help you moving towards the process side of the event process dichotomy. One. Intelligent awareness to neurogi neurological defaults. Two, modify expectations and realign the source of difficulty. Three, identify and visualize the change target. Four, apply mathematics to the goal. Five, identify the daily action target. Six, identify threats to the daily target. Seven, identify the proper battlefields. Eight, attack bad habits with inconvenience and or pain. 9. Act until echo. This is basically observe, practice, master, then develop social intelligence, and just be smart about that. This is exactly what he's describing mastery. And you need to stick to that. And intelligence awareness to neurological default, modify expectation and realign the source of difficulty. This is what we talked about in the compound effect when it was basically about you need to figure out why you need to do a specific thing. And if it's hard, it's not a reason to quit. It would be hard when you start and when you keep the momentum, it's not hard enough. And at some point you take off. Belief number two. The special scam. I'm not good at that. The special scam is a double-edged belief that our innate talents are enough to accomplish our dreams or that our innate talents are immovable, fixed characteristics immune from improvement. 
Underneath the special scam lies the greatest destructive force to our dreams. A fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is the belief that talent alone causes success and that your basic qualities of intelligence, athleticism, and even rhythm are fixed traits that cannot be changed or improved. New skills can be acquired and mastered regardless of your current level of talent or intelligence. This is exactly what we talked about when we were reading about the compound effect. You have no result for a long amount of time. At some point, boom, you go parabolic in terms of improvement. I clip this one. Remember about clipping stuff if you can? Really, really help the channel when you have the punchlines and stuff like that. So yeah, this is basically the belief. Oh, this one is gifted. I can never compete. Guess what? Every year at school, we see gifted people that know they are gifted. They are not working for shit. And I get basically run over by people who are starting from zero, but doing the hard work. I've seen that this year. In class, in the class I had at New Edge, I've seen that with one specific student. On the first course, I was like, oh, this student is kind of normal. And he started asking me a lot of questions. But hey, how can I improve that? How can I improve that? And only three months after, he's the one who did the best exercise homework I've ever seen in two years composition course and this guy went from normal to insanely good in only three months because he walked like fucking mad and this guy is no special he's just, just walking super hard belief number three the consumption scam how much time did that cost? We talked about that yesterday. I was uh, telling you a simple question. Let's say you are earning 20 bucks per hour. You want to buy something that costs 100 bucks. How much does it cost you? Not 100 bucks, but five hours of your life. Debt mandates the necessity of future work, even if you cannot find work. Consumerism has no balanced middle. You are either a consumer or a producer. Or worse, you deny the paradigm altogether. You need to realize, and that's why we were talking about that when we are artists. And that's why the next part of the stream will be super important, even though it's very business oriented. It's basically that as artists, we have a big, big, big problem to solve. We cannot scale um, exponentially our work. We cannot scale the reach, basically. When we are doing art, when we are doing an illustration, it's one illustration for one client in general. There are few ways to scale that exponentially, but generally when you are working for a client, you are doing one amount of work for one client, and there's no way to do this amount of work for three clients at the same time because of NDAs, because of uniqueness of what you are producing and stuff like that. So... The most common way we have as artists, instead of expanding the reach of our work, is to expand the price. We need to find a way to level up in terms of price. We need to find a way to go from 100 per day to 200 to 400 to 500 to 1000 if possible, to as much as we can. Because when there are people asking me how much should I charge, my answer is always as much as you can. As much as you can justify for. One day you got paid 500. This this should be your target now. This should be your bare minimum now. You need to charge as much as possible. And it's not to rob people. It's because when people are paying you more, they respect you more. They respect your time because they know you are expensive and precious. And you also protect your time. Raising your price is a way to protect your time. It's like when someone is doing consultation and is getting very, very busy. There is no choice. You have to protect your time. If you, if you, say at the, if you stay at the same price and you get more and more uh, people asking you, you are just sacrificing more and more of your time for more and more money. 
if you want to earn the same amount of money or more, you have two choices. You can either increase your price. This is a way to filter and to earn more or the same with less amount of time. Or else you need to delegate that to someone else that does it for you and take a cut. These are the two options. But as artists, we cannot delegate some doing the work to someone else. Some studios are able to do that, to do that like uh, Terraform Studio, Chromatic Studio, One Pixel Brush, and stuff like that. It's basically sh for One Pixel Brush, it's like sh Shady Safari. It's so busy and so um, asked for asked for that he has to hire artists to do the work for him. This is a way for him to scale and to delegate his work. But Generally, we have to raise our price. And the problem is that it's very hard for us artists to sell one piece of art to enough people to scale that this way. Unless you have a Patreon, you're doing NFTs and stuff like that. But still, it's very hard to achieve. And it's like another job. You need to learn marketing and stuff like that. And that's why the third part of the presentation about that book would be about business, basically. Okay. So the, the consumption scam, you are owned by your time, basically. Belief number four, the money scam. I can't get rich by wanting to get rich. Fuck no. Nope. Most people are broke and remain broke because the money scam has made them perpetual chaser of something that cannot be chased. It can only be attracted by offering perceived value. And I like what you are writing right now, Q. The biggest challenge for me is to get skilled in Minecraft. The rest is also difficult, but it takes time when acquired with the right mindset. Exactly. And this is the main point. You need to offer perceived value. This is something I'm talking a lot when I'm coaching people about finding their first job. It's basically your job. This is a, a nugget that I'm dropping for my mentorship right now. Your job is to make money regardless of your job. You are selling french fries. Your job is to make money by selling french fries. You're a doctor. Your job is to make money by curing people and helping them in their health. You are an artist, your job is to make money to the company that hires you by producing art. So how do you produce money to a company? Simple. You make them earn more money than what you are costing them. Okay. So with that in mind, what you can do, and this is not groundbreaking, but this is something you need to think about how to apply that then as a job. To offer perceived value, you need to bring them more and cost them less how can you cost to a company that hires you as a junior when you are a junior they need to train you it costs them time and money you are not autonomous you need to learn their style their process their tools their art direction stuff like that so it consumes time and this time spent on learning all of that and becoming eventually autonomous is money that they are losing. So if you can offset that by showing already those qualities, showing that you already understand their art direction, their tools, their process and such, you can offset the balance because they will think, hey, we need to spend more time and so less money to train that person and so this person can become an asset quicker. So this person will be more profitable for us, faster and easier. Plus it displays potential for growth. So this is how you are offering the sense of perceived value with your work. And the way you need to display that for your first job is through your portfolio. This is a, a fucking bomb that I just dropped right now. It's from my mentorship. I clipped that, by the way. If you can, if you want to clip that again, just to be sure you can. You can only attract money by offering perceived value. Always remember that. This is super important as an artist. Your art 
doesn't matter at all to a company if it's not offering perceived value. You can do the best art, the most storytelling field art, the most beautiful stuff. If it's not offering perceived value cater to the company you are applying to, they won't give a single shit. You can be the best artist mimicking Riot Games. If you are applying to Ubisoft with that, it won't be seen as perceived value. But if you apply to Riot Games with that, it will appear as perceived value. Because perceived value for one company or one client is not the same. They don't have the same criteria for art, process, art direction, intent, emotions, rendering tools and stuff like that. You can be the best at Maya if they are working exclusively on 3ds Max. You missed the shot. This is why you need to do your fucking research about the company that you are applying to. This way, you can better display perceived value for them. Make sense? I'm dropping fucking gold right now. But co money can only be attracted by offering perceived value. This is one of the most important thing in the entire book. And this is that simple. But once you know that, you need to find ways to apply that to your field. And as an artist, that's exactly what I, what I told you. This is very different if you are like a Patreon, for example. If you are a Patreon and, and, and a niche, they want what you do, regardless of what it is. This is good. But for a company, you need to comply to what they want. Especially as a junior. Once you are a fucking superstar like Piotr Jablonski, they come to you for what you offer. Because they like it. They identify to it. But as you are no one when you start, you need to channel your value towards and to mold it in ways that looks valuable to the company you are aiming at. This is why with a single portfolio, you cannot apply to both Blizzard and Ubisoft and EA and Bungie and different stuff. This is why when you are doing sci-fi, you have no chances of go going, of getting a work on a fantasy project. Because they just don't want sci-fi. They want fantasy. So even if your sci-fi is super valuable for a sci-fi project, like Destiny or Mass Effect or Star Wars or stuff like that, it will not be relevant for a fantasy project. You need to clip all those 10 minutes. This is fucking gold, guys. <laughs> Belief number five, the poverty scam. I am poor because you're rich. Oh my God, this, going, this one is going to be super polarizing. I don't want to get into politics. The book says, sorry, you are poor because you keep buying shit you shouldn't buy, instead, including fantasies that don't exist. The truth is, everything great in society has happened because money moved massively due to massive value creation and delivery. And yes, this created rich people. I'm repeating that. Everything great in society has happened because money moved massively due to massive value creation and delivery. And yes, this created rich people. Without wealth, you will be transported back to the Dark Ages. You would shit in a in an hard house, burn candles for light, and use pigeons to send letters to your girl in Akron. Let's have examples. Let's have fucking examples. Internet made people insanely rich. Google, for example, let's take Google. Google created massive value because it made everything on the internet easier. It's like the biggest research tool in the world. It created a lot of opportunities to, for companies to get seen online thanks to that. It's creating a massive value and massive shift of money across the world. That's why they are fucking rich. Facebook. It's the biggest data bank about people in the world. And if you are a company, you can use the Facebook ads 
cater specifically towards very specific kind of people to sell them exactly what they need thanks to this data so it's creating massive value again so that's why Mark Zuckerberg is fucking rich Apple again creating massive value with the simplest yet most complex and rich tool ever created you have basically this with this you can communicate with everyone be connected all the time and have access to infinite amount of information just in your fucking hand so it's created massive value again that's why apple is the biggest company in the world amazon allowing everyone to get everything they want within a few days with the best customer service in the world, arguably. We are not discussing the condition of work at Amazon. They are terrible, by the way. But from a customer standpoint, this is the best customer service ever. Something is defective, no question asked, you return them. They get, they get you a new one or they get your money back. You get your money back. So again, creative massive value. So they are earning massive money. Let's move that towards video games. Let's pick the big video games that mark history. World of Warcraft. Millions and millions of players connected together in a persistent world and building something together for the first time ever. Massive value for people. Even if it's not monetary. But massive value for a lot of people spend thousands and thousands of hours in the game they, they became massively rich with that same with Skyrim massive value incredible story incredible world building everything is interesting gameplay is fantastic graphics are fucking cool massive value massive results Minecraft infinite Lego game without having to buy the bricks massive value massive player base massive income Great value precedes great wealth. If you want to make millions, impact millions. Become a worthwhile fiduciary to your fellow man and you will stop being worthless. You make money by bringing value to people. So this is why, in my opinion, the narrative of people are rich because they rob from someone else is fucking shit. Because the biggest way, especially today, to sell something is to make people around you have benefits from that. And the way they are monitoring that and compensating you for that service is by paying you. But everyone paying you for that service is technically happy to do so. We are not talking about taxes and stuff like that, by the way. This is completely different. But like Apple... You decide to pay for that. Spotify, you decide to pay for that because it's... Because the, the, the fact of paying a certain price is completely okay and relevant for the benefits it brings to you, according to you, and you are the only judge to that. And even people criticizing, like, predatory monetization within games and stuff like that, if people are still playing like that, that's because they want to do that. Of course, there is always a very thin line because sometimes predatory monetization within game is using addiction and gambling addiction processes. And this is where there's a fine line not to cross. But in, at least in general, generally that's because there is a perceived value. The way you are getting people to see that perceived value is where the morality is but we are not, we are not here for to to debate that but if you want to make millions impact millions that's as simple as that you see jama it probably makes millions of dollars to be honest 
don't want to dox him and I don't care. That's because he's impacting the entire fucking industry. He's pushing the boundaries of the industry all on his own. With new softwares, with new techniques, with new tools, with crazy combo in new softwares. He's like the, the mad scientist. He's like the Albert Einstein of concept art today. Belief number six, that's my favorite one. The luck scam. You don't play, you don't win. Luck, bad or good, is just what you call the result of a human being cautiously interacting with chance. And some people are better at interacting with chance than others. Unlike money, luck has no brain and holds no grudges or prejudice. It only reacts to mathematical probabilities of an applied stimulus. As my definition of luck and chance. Luck is your ability to recognize an opportunity, seize that, seize that opportunity, and handle the consequences well. If you are unable to recognize an opportunity, you won't seize it. If you are able to recognize it, but unable to take it, you will have regret not having taken it. And if you are recognizing the opportunity, you are taking it, but you are unable to handle the consequences properly. Again, it will be fucked up. So when someone is telling me, you are fucking lucky. No, I might have been lucky, but I, I had the skill and the perceptiveness to recognize the opportunity. I had the balls to take it, to size it, and to accept it might be a failure. And I have the skill and the competence and the talent to handle that properly. So whether I'm lucky or not, this is not just luck. And you see that all the time with like investors and I, I see that a lot with like crypto people. It's like, you're so lucky having bought Bitcoin at 10k. Body. You have not experienced the fucking crash in March, the COVID crash, the crash in March, thanks to Elon and the current crash. And people are freaking out. So don't call me lucky because it took me a lot of balls or being completely stupid to buy Bitcoin. This is not a financial advice, but this is just an example. It took me, it took someone courage, balls, curiosity or whatever to buy it. And a lot of fortitude to hold all that. To have diamond head while it was crashing all the time, going up and down, and to handle the volatility. So it's not just luck. It's also a lot of other stuff. It's fortitude. And haven't you noticed people complaining about luck are always unlucky? Always. Because it creates them to believe that I am unlucky, so why even try? You don't play, you don't lose. So they play not to lose, so they don't try. Have you seen that around you? I'm feeling like I'm absolutely shooting at people right now. Lucky shit. It's like pure math, and there's always a comparison I dare to do. This is hypothetical, of course, so don't crucify me for that. Let's imagine in a perfect world that you are you are looking for someone, for a partner, like a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. You are in your town, there is one million people. Let's say 50-50. So, amongst those 1 million people, let's assume there is half of the population, regardless of what you are interested in, it, either half or the entire population, that has the first qualification to potentially interest you. Cool. Okay, so that's 500k people. Let's say you have an age bracket that interests you. Let's say this is like 10% of people. 50k. 
let's say you have either physical or psychological criteria, whatever. You have three uh, percent of that, so that's like um, let me. One point five k people. Let's say that a quarter of them, let's say half of them, already have someone. Seven hundred fifty. Let's say you go in the street, and most people would be repelled if you talk to them in the street. Have that again. Three hundred and twenty-five people. I said there is another arbitrary criteria, it doesn't match or whatever. Half that. Maybe just take a third of that. That's it, 100 people in your city you might be able to spend your time with. That's a lot of people! But, if you are not recognizing those people, daring to talk to them, regardless of the medium you are using, that might be text, the street, in person, through phone, for whatever. It doesn't matter, that's not a debate. And you are not able to handle that properly and you you are basically making them freak out, it will be zero. So in order to have that, it's not about luck, it's about being perceptive enough to be attentive to the opportunities that might work. It's not say that it will work, but it might work. Then, daring to talk to them regardless of the way you are doing that, and then handling that properly in an appropriate and correct way. But this is absolutely not luck. It's just a game of numbers and then skills. And this is the same with the industry. There are dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of job offers every day. You need to recognize them. You need to find them. You need to size them. And you need to be the perfect candidate by providing positive value to them. So it's not luck if you are hired. Of course, if everyone is lucky to meet sometimes someone at the bar, I met the art director of, of Ori and the Wheel of the Wisp in the fucking toilets in London. This is fucking luck, but this is an opportunity to talk to them and, and handle the conversation well. So, of course, this was luck. But then, me talking to them was not luck. So, luck is a fucking scam. Of course, there is pure luck like winning the lottery. But still, we can argue that instead of winning the lottery, which is a tax for stupid people, in my opinion, you could invest that properly. You could invest that properly. And you will have more chances to win over time. How many, time. how many times do you have to try the lottery before winning the big prize? Millions and millions of times and there is no guarantee. Let's say every time you are about to play, you invest that. For years and years and years. And you manage to do that in a smart way. That makes you win. You will get way more money. And you will get it at least. Not hypothetically, randomly. You will get it. Next belief, the frugality scam. Live poor, die rich. The frugality scam, the belief that obsessive expense reduction, like penny pinching and exper experiential deprivation, will someday pay off in the opposite, rich life experience, freedom and abundance. If you don't have a sizable income, it doesn't matter how cheap you are, you can squeeze a dime from a nickel. Boom. The get-rich-quick scheme might indeed exist, but don't mistake that for get-rich-easy. Years of discipline, focused work channeled into the right business system can make it happen. Easy is not part of the equation. And that's something my mentor is telling me all the time and he's telling to the other people in the community all the time when they are like, hey, I'm fucking broke or can I save money? No, don't save fucking money. Try to find, do your best to find a solution to make more money. This way you don't have to save. 
And you, should, and you know what? Buy something that makes you uncomfortable. Buy a big apartment that is way above your means. This will force you to get more money. This will force you to commit and you will figure out how to do that later. That's the 10x goal. Aim higher and develop solutions that are way bigger than what was expected in the first time. This is completely against what I say in my mentorship, like buy something cheap and squeeze everything at the beginning because you are trying to pay a student loan. This is different. But still, it doesn't mean that you should just rely on that. You should rely both on saving at the beginning. As long as you have debt, you should not have big expenses. You should save as much money as you can to pay your loan because this is your absolute priority. And then, at the same time, you need to figure a way to make more and more money in an explosive way. That's something that I told my client when uh, I was doing the negotiation. It was like, hey, after every year of longevity, you will earn 100 euros more per month. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Stupid. I 4x my income in one year. I'm not planning to stop. I want to 4x it this year too. I want to fucking 10x it. That's, that's a 10x goal. And... If my ambition is to just have at least 20% more, this is already a lot. But if my goal is to aim at 4x my salary, my current income, not just salary, but overall income, 100 euro per month after one year of longevity if we won't make the cut. It's garbage. I wouldn't spit on it, of course. It's still money. But this is garbage as a carrot to dangle. And some people fall for that. In five years of experience, I've been um, almost 6xing my incomes. In five years in the industry, five full years. This is not entirely thanks to the industry. Because I'm also having some side business, of course. But some people in five years, they only earn like 20% more. What is greater between in 20% more and 600%? And this is not too flex. This is just that people live with the frugality scam. Like, save everything. Yeah, of course, don't spend on shit you don't need. Don't spend more than you earn. When you have student loan, when you are a student, save as much as you can. Of course, don't deprive yourself. Still enjoy life, but in a reasonable way. Don't drink your hard-earned money. Don't drink everything, but have a drink, have a coffee sometimes with friends because it will make you feel better. It will get, get yourself some treats. Don't live like a fucking monk because it will keep you balanced. But don't spend on shit you don't need. Budget everything, track down every penny that you spent. And still when you are fucking rich, track down every penny that you spent. You can't control what you are not monitoring. And when you are a student, you need your first priority is to first be financially stable and not being under zero at the end of the month. And secondly, to pay your student loan. So this is your absolute priority and nothing should matter because as long as you have student loan, your quote unquote adult life when you want to have a car, a house, loan, some kids, some wife or husband or whatever in between, it's not possible, it's delayed. Because if you have to pay 400 bucks per month, every month for 10 years, you will have to wait 10 years before getting a fucking house. And when you are 35, if you want to get a loan for a house, bankers will be way more shy at you being 35 than you being 30 or 25. That's why paying your student loan is your absolute priority because it delays your adult life. 
we talked about it. And you need to save up that cash and pay as much of your student loan first. Once it's done, then keep saving, but keep earning more. And my strategy, it was like an entire mentorship and I'm not the biggest businessman to explain to you that. But basically, I'm explaining how to save money on simple stuff. Don't buy expensive furniture. Get a fucking roommate for the first two years you are working. This is fine. You're splitting the bills. You are saving so much money. Or better, if you can be at your parents' home when you are working on your first job, you can just save everything and pay your student loan in one year. This is fantastic. Pay that and then you are free. This is the price. One year at, at your parents' home, even though it's hell, might be the price for 10 years for saving 10 years of servitude. Saving yourself from 10 years of servitude to the bank. What do you prefer? One year at your parents' home or 10 years being a slave to the banks and being owned by time and end up the month with 50 bucks? That's your choice. But still, even if you have your first job, find ways to make more money all the time. We're going to talk about a book. Next reading is a book called You Need More Money by Matt Monero. We're going to talk about that. Matt Monero... And the You Need More Money book is a very, very tough book to read. Because he's telling a story about a friend of him that has cancer. And pff, this is heavy stuff. The purpose of that book is you just need fucking more money. All the time. All the time. And it's not to flex and have Lambos and Rolex and stuff like that. It's just because it gives you quiet, peace, calm, no worry... And when you need to afford something, whatever happens to you, your, your tire is flat, your computer broke, your house burned. It's like, okay, it's not a problem. That's my money. No problem. I had a summer job that was full time for three months in 2020 and I saved up cash. Even today, I use 30% of my used money. I'm economic about it because anything can happen to me. So I keep it for important stuff. Yeah, there was a um, stream I did about money few months ago and basically that's something you need to build after your student loan you need to build a safety net let's say you get an accident you can't use your hand for i don't know one year can you afford living without working for one year just for six months to me six months is like the minimum safety net and every time i'm going under six months i feel like shit this dread feeling like oh my god i'm gonna die i mean I'm unable to, to fucking... I would be unable to fucking live with my apartment. I would have to go back to my parents. This is my sa safety net of six months. Before it was three months, it was nothing. I was dreading. That dread feeling, not being able to sleep at night because you don't know if you are able to pay your bills next month is probably one of the, one of the most horrible feeling ever. It disappears once you have this six-month safety net and you know you can find a job in between. It disappears. It's still there a bit. Instead of being a 9 out of 10, it's like a 2. It's unnatural. Uh, when it is the right moment to start building up that system as fast as you can. Right now. Right now. Don't put everything into it. But everything you don't need, put it in your safety net. That's just my opinion, by the way. I'm not a financial advisor, but I think I would be... I think I'm already handling my money better than my broke banker. That's just my opinion. This guy is adorable outside of that. He's adorable. It's all about being reasonable. And that's why you need both of them. You, you need both... You see the, the two... The two paths... There is the, the slow lane, which is basically trade today for tomorrow. And there is basically the, 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 the YOLO path, the, the sidewalk, trade tomorrow for today. You need a healthy balance between both. If you only save, if you only trade today for tomorrow, you are basically depriving yourself. You will live poor and you will die rich. If you do the sidewalk, if you trade tomorrow for today, 
you will basically be always dreading financially till the rest of your life. But you will enjoy, quote unquote, enjoy stuff with shit that you don't need. So you need a healthy balance between both of them, basically. You need to be able to save at the same time enjoy the present in a healthy and non-dangerous way, financially speaking. Makes sense? I think we talked about that, um, Petit Poirot. You were talking about that you were tracking every penny that you had, and sometimes it was okay to buy a beer or a coffee with friends. And this is perfectly fine. And you know what? Go for it. Go for it. This is fine. You need to treat yourself. Oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way. Uh, I was supposed to join the Discord. So if you want to join, feel free to join. I'm just letting you, um, I'm just trusting you to be in push to talk. This way we can, uh, um, we can keep going. And if you want to discuss about that, um, feel free to talk. So hey, let's move on. Let's move on. So that was the belief. Luck scam. Frugality scam. Uh, next one. The compound interest scam. Wall Street ain't making you rich. The compound interest scam is this serendipitous orthodoxy that the stock markets will some days make you the common people and commonly rich. Will by time, reality and inflation the fiscal tree cycle debugs compound interest. And it's why it won't make you rich. Truth number one, time. Resign yourself to the compound interest for wealth and you've resigned yourself to hope and time for freedom. Hope I'm alive after X decades. Hope my money is worth something after X decades. Hope the market yields X percent after X decades. Sorry, hope based on variable returns Viable market instruments and viable life expectancy is a terrible plan. What if you don't live to 65? What if the stock market crash? Spoiler alert, it will very soon. Uh, what if the returns go to negative? Spoiler alert, it will soon. And if, if it's not the return, it's just the price of dollars. It's going to shit. It's going to fucking zero. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'm not a financial expert, but Dora is like the worst token ever. Fucking centralized, one node, no limit in the, um, in the amount, in the supply. Always most, you are diluting the value all the time. This is a shit, shit, shit money. Truth number two, reality. In the financial markets, an interest rate or growth rest rate must be attributed to a financial instrument such as a stock, a bond, or an asset class. Interest or growth rate cannot exist without a corresponding instrument or asset class attached. This creates the rate, and each instrument carries risk, which means you could lose some or all of your money. So this is not safe. Plus you have to hope, so you are stacking the variables against you. Hello, Kyo. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, hey. I'm doing great. Uh, don't mind me. I'm just going to sit in the voice chat and uh, if there's something interesting, I'm going to, you know, talk with you. And yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Feel free to do so. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, reality. That's that. And the truth number three, inflation. Get ready for a truth bomb. The utopian chart cannot be trusted because trust is not in the calculation. Can you trust the government to be a good steward of taxpayer money? Can you trust fiscal policy makers to keep inflation from exploding? Just look at what happened in the last two years with the, the COVID and the money printing. Inflation skyrocketed. R look at the price of wood. Look at the price of paper. Look at the price of gas, especially in France right now. It's crazy fucking high. Look at the price of common food like pasta, rice, meat. It's at least plus 30% in two years. So it means that you are 30% less rich. Failure. Uh, yeah. Can you trust a growing economy for five decades? Answer these questions honestly and you will realize inflation is a gamble 
and your bet is placed with people who historically have not been prudent. Look at Wall Street crash in twenty uh, in um, two thousand and eight. Was basically people who are not prudent with the stock market. Failure is normally temporary and can be remedied by trying again. A compound interest failure is permanent because its attempt spans decades. Trying again is impossible over decades. Let's say you have been holding your stock bond for 30 years. It was growing and one day, boom, to zero. You lost 30 years of investment right now. Let me let me show you a meme. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Let me show you something. I'm gonna cut the music. Okay, be, be ready to see why the stock market is shit. This is with crypto, but stock market is exactly the same. This is with one specific shit coin called BitConnect. Don't buy that shit, it's dead. Look at that. This, hey, was, hey, hey, this was in 2017. At the time, BitConnect was skyrocketing. This guy is a normal guy who was an overnight million, millionaire Thanks to that. Look at that. It's like a big convention about BitConnect. Spoiler alert, this is very cringe. Hey, 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 everybody. My name is Carlos Matos, and I am coming from New York City, New York. Let me tell you guys that I am so excited. I am so happy. I am really so thrilled to be right now sharing this amazing, glorious, super, and exciting moment of my life with all of you guys. Let me tell you really changing the world as we know it the world is not anymore the way it used to be wow no 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 <laughs> jesus man he's so fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. i didn't feel like that at first time like watching that video it's so wow. unpro un unprofessional and Be it's just what the fuck yeah <laughs> When you see that, this is basically a top signal that you should absolutely sell. <laughs> So guys, I want to tell you something. Faith and belief is the one thing that we all need to be able to change. Faith and belief. It's called hope. And hope is a terrible plan, buddy. Opportunity for us to change this entire world. I am so proud. I am so honored. 
I am so excited to be here right now. And let me tell you something that each and every one of you has the opportunity to become like those amazing people that we know here from Vietnam. Hey, hey, my Super Saiyan mode. Okay, are you ready for the the graph and the chart about B Connect? Congrats. Congrats, buddy. You are basically right there at the time. Where was it? Right there. And boom, went to fucking zero. Wow. This is why stock market is very fucking risky. I'm not saying you should people should not do this. I'm not the one to advise for or against it. I'm just saying that betting all your life savings on one thing and hoping because I believe I have faith. This is hope. This is hope. I believe that Big Connect will change my life forever. And then boom, it crashed. You cannot try again because you lost everything. Oh, yeah. And also, in the end, Wall Street is not a place for growing wealth, but a place for asset speculation, earning incomes, and deploying capital. It's not for growing wealth. Yes, save early and often. However, don't think you can sail to the promised land on a company interest wave. It's ineffective for creating wealth unless millions are amassed, are amassed first. Then it's powerful, perhaps as powerful as Lustig's money printing machine. You can debate about crypto too if you want, but I'm, that's not the debate and it would be illegal to debate about that, so let's not talk about it. But basically, trust and hope that the lottery machine will make you rich is fucking shit. It's as simple as that. Let's talk then about the biases, your brain's delusions. There are seven primary brain battles you will face. The first one, change adversity. Why refusing change is refusing excellence. Your brain's quarterback in the authentic you versus your brain war is change adversity. Change adversity is your brain's predilection for comfort and status quo, despite being surrounded by change. Behind change, behind change adversity is what called the stat, what is called the status quo's bias. Our brain's preference for predictability over instability. With change adversity as our brain's frontline defense, change adversity's threats are double-edged. This is basically refusing to step outside of your comfort zone. We talked about that a lot already. Second one, righteousness. This one, I hate this one. Hello, Bob. This is your bias. Why you would be rather right than rich? Righteousness is not about being fair or just about our urgency to see and hear only that the only only things that support our biases while discounting, ignoring and arguing the rest. It's basically when someone is saying it's not moral. When someone is uh, summoning the moral argument to win an argument, basically. To win a discussion. It's like, you, you might do that, but I am moral, me. So I am better than you. No, fuck you, buddy. I'm using that as a fucking consolation prize. To justify you failing. And as we have seen, growing wealth, you can do that in a healthy way. By bringing value to people giving you money. So everyone's winning. That's why we print bills to make everyone winning technically. 
But at least that's why we should be printing uh, bills. Antithetical apathy. That's the next one. Those suffocating shouldn't hate hair. It's fine. If financial freedom and autonomy are your goals, your beliefs must align with these goals. If they don't, you will either A. Lie to yourself or B. Sabotage your efforts. Because intention and stress both make goals unobtainable. It's exactly, oh, I'm so poor, so I hate the rich. When you are choking, you are not hating hair. So don't wish the world is better, wish you are better. It's not because of Star Wars that your life is shit. It's not because Friends is making some jokes that don't, doesn't appeal to you that your life is shit. It's not because someone else is rich that you are fucking living miserably. It's as simple as that. So don't hate the player, hate the game. Or rather than hating the game, learn it, practice it, master it, excel at it, and do whatever the fuck you want. Samuel washing. That's the next one. Unconventional compels conventional reactions. When traditional paradigms are opposed or questioned, not only is the message attacked, but so is the messenger. As Samuel washing is the friction we face when other people discover we aren't following the conventional scripted brainwash. Samuel washing is exactly what we talked about when we refer to when people want to bring you back to what they deem normal. That's exactly that. That's that feeling of losing that person or feeling fucking alone. And this is basically a bias. A bias to try to bring you back. Next one. Podium pumping. Why someone else's pen can't write your history? We're all perfectly imperfect, including our heroes. While doing X, Y, and Z might have worked for Jobs or Bill Gates whoever you want it might not work for you every one of us needs to stop hero worshipping mortal beings and be your own heroes to be a hero to your wife to your family and to your children stop trying to write your history with someone else's pen instead start using your own it's exactly what is described in mastery you learn from the mentor you observe you practice and when once you start developing your own style you distance yourself from the mentor because you don't want to walk indefinitely in their path. You want to become you at some point. Next bias, survival spotlighting. Failures keeps their move closed. Survival spotlighting, which is similar to podium popping, is when you focus on the survivors of some process because they are showcased while overlooking those who are not, usually due to the lack of visibility or hence you come to an inaccurate conclusion. This is basically when you are watching our station, you see only the crazy good piece. You don't see all the bolts of papers and all the failed sketch that everyone is doing all the time. And guess what? There is way more than what is on our station. Next one. Momentum paralysis. Why you can't move despite movement? Momentum paralysis is not about immobility, but being unable to depart from your current course of action. This is our tendency to allow momentum or flow to carry us through life rather than, than making proactive decisions, which are decidedly better for our future. Even when those decisions have painful or uncomfortable attachments. This is what we talked about in the compound effect. The hardest part is to get the initial momentum. Once you have it, you can get carried by it. You just have to kindle it and not make it stop. An example to show that starting things is hard. When I was starting going at the gym, something that was pretty hard for me was just to stick to it. Because I was like, oh my god, I'm going to have to go through two hours of bench press and stuff like that. I'm going to be feeling like shit after and stuff like that. It was hard at the beginning. Something you can do to trick yourself, that's a paradox who told me that. And thank you so much for that advice, buddy. This is so great. Basically, instead of telling yourself, today I need to do my entire gym program, just tell yourself, my only objective is to enter the gym and then I'm free to leave. But because you committed to it, you are more likely to do your session. 
something I'm doing at home right now is because I have my gym right now, so I cannot commit to that, is today my objective is just to put on my sport clothes. Then because I spent two minutes doing that, I committed, I generated to do my, my session. For your work, it can be, my objective today is just to open Photoshop and 3ds Max. I'm free to close it, but once it's open, and to open my scene, and to open my scene. Once it's done, you are free to close. Actually, once the scene is open, you start working on that. My objective today was, I need just to, to listen to the first chapter of Traffic Secret by Russell Brunson. It's a book about uh, gathering public, and we need that for the mentorship. And I started one hour before the stream, and I was kind of pissed that the stream was starting, not that I don't want to do that, but I was so inside the book that I just wanted to continue. It's just commit first, you will get the momentum later, and find a small way to commit, just one step. Hello, Mika Art Gaming. Welcome, buddy. Nice to see you back. Next one. Let's talk about bullshit from bullshitters. Crutches, cliches, and cults. This story exemplifies the next B amongst the three Bs. Bullshit. Bullshit 1.0 is crutches. The stinking pile of excuses and manufactured fairy tales we tell ourselves. The scapegoats justified do nothingness. Other times they explain away failures or circumstances. As long as we clutch those convenient fantasies, change adversity and righteousness bribes us into buying of victimhood. This is like, oh, I'm always unlucky. There's always an excuse. Losers, they always have an excuse. It's like, oh, it's not my fault. It's because of the weather. Uh, I was unlucky. This guy was an asshole. Uh, I was not in the right mood today. Stuff like that. No. Find excuses or fucking solution, buddy. Bullshit 2.0 is cliches. A bunch of meaningless mantras and proverbs revered as gospel. Pity slogans, sweet and soothing, rassuring, and unfortunately, invitations for more do nothingness. The biggest one I have is I couldn't have a tata, live without problem. Need to be happy with very little. Like all the world is near shit. Some of those was Disney are crazy good. Like Mulan, it's like, okay, you need to work fucking hard and fucking smart to become a warrior. That's why I, I love Mulan. At least the, the, the animated one, not the, not the most recent one. But it's basically... You have Mulan. She's not supposed to fight. She has never been trained to fight. And she's admitting very fast that in no way she can compete physically with all the men around her in the army. I'm not debating if it's good or not, whatever, that's not the subject, don't crucify me on that, but that's the the, 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 the purpose of the initial, that's the initial statement when she when she's joining the army and there is these uh, steps that, here is a belt, there are some weights and you need to climb that pole. And she's like, oh my god, that's too strong. And you have some some of the guys and she's unable to succeed because it's too, it's too heavy for her. And you have some guys that are stronger and they are trying to brute force through it and it's not working either. And what is very good in that is that she's learning strength, but she's the first one to succeed because she's smart by uh, tangling the stuff together and using that as a, as a lever to pull herself. And it's like a combination of strength and smart. And she's bringing the smart aspect to all the other guys that are big brutes. They are complementing each other and that's why it's so freaking cool. So this is like the good messages from Disney. It's like, be strong, but be fucking smart too. And then you have like the Hakuna Matata and uh, um, the um, the Bear Necessity song in the Jungle's book and shit like that. It's like, okay, be grateful. But don't be happy about that. Don't be happy about eating fucking cockroaches under a bark. This is disgusting. Who wants to eat fucking worms and cockroaches under a tree bark for its entire life? Look at Timo and Pumba, they're fucking losers. They are making Simba a fucking loser too. He was supposed to become the fucking king. And 
he's becoming a stupid adolescent. Like a lazy prick. That's only when uh, Nana comes back and he's facing his responsibilities that he's like, okay, I, I, I need to get myself sorted out. Because Nala is literally telling him figuratively stop being a piece of shit. Then there is the, the vision with the, the father and Slack like, stop being a piece of shit. So I'm fucking ashamed of you. Uh, the, the equivalent of that South Park character, the geek in the World of Warcraft episode, playing in its mom, in its mom basement. Stop being that piece of shit. Be who you were supposed to become. So a lot of cliche like that, like uh, money doesn't bring happiness. No, but you can buy a fuck ton of, of stuff and you can have quiet, which is a lot contributing to your happiness. Or something like uh, greed is the root of all evil. Yeah, but wanting money is not being greedy. It's just wanting to live decently and worry free. And if you do that safely, you're bringing value to people around you. With something like, uh, yeah, why are you working so hard? It doesn't matter in the end. What the fuck, buddy? Stop. You deserve a kick in the nuts. You fucking donkey. First, third bullshit is cults and their leaders. Gurus and slithery figurehead would fill your hand with whatever you want it filled with. And basically, money buys happiness when you let it buy your freedom. The paradox of practice is the art of selling a strategy that the author doesn't really use, that isn't responsible for making him rich. So that's with all the gurus and shit like that. Now, let's call about burring bullshit. The free bulldozers to, de to destroy them, basically. Finally, we are... Talking about the techniques to unplug from the, the matrix. The first technique is Socratic questioning. Socratic questioning is a discipline inquired into trains of thoughts. By looking to the depths of these trains, biases and assumptions and possible blocks of progress that are uncovered. Basically, the Socratic questioning is like asking the question like a child, like why, why, why? And generally, after asking why for five or six times, you have completely broken down any ID. Any argument that you don't like, ask why five or six times. And generally, the person in front of you is, of course, hating you. But also, you have completely dismantled this argument. So, like, uh, money doesn't buy happiness. Why? Because uh, happiness uh, is not about money. Why? Because uh, happiness is about being fulfilled in life and uh, doing what you want. Why? Uh, because doing what you want is important. Why? And so on and so on at some point. So, okay. So how do you access, um, doing whatever you want? Uh, you need free time. And how do you have free time? How do you free up some time? You don't have to work. And how do you start working? What do you need to start to stop working? Well, uh, oh, you need money. There we go! The prophecy is true! That's a quality questioning. The second technique is very... very strange. It's called the Cancer Corollary. The Cancer Corollary is a hypothetical syllogism, syllogism that exposes cerebral bullshit and eradicates it. Used willfully, it keeps paper crutches and dart boarded excuses. Anytime your several dogma moves and argues you're too young, too old, too poor, too this and too that, the cancer corollary breaks the pattern. It's basically if you had only one year left to live, what will you do? Nothing else matter. Stop wasting time, you stop finding excuses. If you had only one year. If your name was written on the fucking death note, you had one year left before you die, and you have your ultimate goal, you will probably find the ways to achieve that. 
if you want to even further eradicate that. Someone puts a gun on your on your head. And it's like, do this within 30 months or you die. You will find the energy to do this because it's a fuck this event and you find the energy to do so. So excuses are irrelevant. It's basically the, oh, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too weak, I'm too strong, I'm too whatever. When someone... <clears throat> Once someone has what you desperately want or need, their backstory becomes irrelevant. And this is irrelevant because it proves that race, education, divorce, marriage, ugliness, this, that, are all self-funded delusions. The fact is what you have is the fact is when you have what other wants, no one cares about your circumstances, your wife, your motives, your degree, your history, your anything. Okay. I don't want to slip into heated debate, but look at like Kenny West, is Kenny West, Obama, Obama. They are objectively very successful people. Has it been hard for them due to the color of their skin? Yeah, probably. But still, they are the top. It means that these excuses doesn't matter because they are the perfect counterexample. Was it hard? Probably. Probably. Was it harder? Probably too. But still, it's not impossible. Technique number three, identity cataclysm. This is like the cancer example. Real change comes from identity and self, not from interim motivation jump started by books or YouTube bing bingings. Basically, you have to be what you want to become first so the action can fall. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Be, act on being, then have. In the... Um In the Discord link, but I drop a um, graph about that. Give me a sec. Uh, Where is that? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna send it to you at some point. So, yeah. Great results require great commitment. Commitment fires the process principle where habits become lifestyle and lifestyles become winning results. That's the compound effect in action. The book is uh, telling some stuff. Beware the one dot wins of epically bad life advice. <laughs> I love this one. When passion doesn't solve pro people's problems, passion doesn't pay bills. And this is super important for artists because we are passionate about what we do. And we need our passion to pay bills first, because if it doesn't, first we can't practice it, and nothing else matters. Nothing else becomes irrelevant. Hello, kitty. Hello, kitty. When there is no keyboards in the balls, everything becomes irrelevant. Notably, when the world kicks on your feedback loops and says, this is awesome, or I like this, here is my cash. You too will love what you do. I know I'm talking to a lot of students right now, but trust me, the first time someone is giving you money, even if it's five bucks, because they like your stuff, it's like the most incredible feeling ever. I remember uh, it was last year when I sold my first NFT. It was an incredible feeling. It was like, hey, a random stranger on the internet was willing to send me a bit of his hard-earned money. Plus, it's an appreciating asset that is Ethereum. He's willing to send me that without even knowing me just because he appreciates my art. It's like the best feeling ever. And this is not just about money. This is like, even when someone is... Uh, well, uh, I'm always thinking about my owls right now. And this is not to to, to flex or whatever. My, my owl product is pretty old and pictures are pretty outdated. But every time I show one of the pictures from my owls and um, someone is telling me truthfully... And honestly, that 
This is like a moving piece. He talks to them. I, this is like the best reward ever. Thank you. Oh, hello, Wolf. How are you doing, buddy? But every time someone is telling me, I, I, I don't know what there is in that picture, but I, I, I like and I find it emotion. It's like, wow. It's like. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> every time you have that feedback loop, you absolutely love even more what you are doing. So this is a positive feedback loop, basically. The feedback loop drives passion, which drives action, which drives results. So it's like a positive feedback loop where you feed from your success and you do even more. So you achieve even more, even more and exponentially. Again, this is the compound effect. So it's easy to love what you do when others do too. But you need to be passionate about what needs to be done. You need to, you need to not be passionate about what needs to be done. But you need to be passionate about what you will become. So you don't need to be passionate about the process. But you need to be passionate about what you will become and the result. Yeah, negative feedback loops is exactly the same. It's like you start, you hate what you do. You want to do even less. You procrastinate on that. And you start hating even more. It's like having a slave job. And this is why when you have a slave job or when you have a student job during the summer or stuff like that and you hate that because honestly selling stuff at the grocery store is not the best job ever, of course. You need to re... Hello, Foscog. Hello, buddy. You need to remember... Not about the process. You need to think not about the process, but about what it will bring to you. You need to remember why you are doing that. I'm thinking all the time about that when I'm doing the streams. I don't really like to expose my persona in public and show my face in public. I'm pretty introverted. But I'm not passionate about the streams. I really like streaming. Don't get me wrong, especially talking to all of you guys. I really like that and I think you feel that. I really like that. I would love to do that all day. But I'm passionate not about doing the streams, but about the results that it will bring over time. Building a fucking big community of very motivated and achieve, high achieving people, the next generation of great artists that will gather together and sharpen steel against each other. Iron sharpening iron, basically. So I'm very passionate about that. How many years was that when we met Ulf? I think it was in 2016, something like that. I was a fucking dog at the time. <laughs> we, were so, we, were, we were such fucking dogs at the time. It was so cool. <laughs> I remember there was Boris too. There was... Um, what is that called? Uh, Advanced Building Cat, Jack. Uh, there was um, the partner of Anthony Jones now. Um, I don't remember the name. The black guy. I was talking like a rapper. Oh, what's the name of that guy? I don't remember. He's the partner of Anthony Jones now. You know what I mean. There was Boris, there was you, there was um, Tom Field, such a good guy. There was... Um... Oh yeah, Tom is popping off on Instagram, that's crazy. He's so good now. He started from zero. There's a proof that hard work can lead to basically anything. Let me check his Instagram. The art of Tom Field. Do you have the do you have the, the tag for is that Tom Field art, Tom Vernon Field? Tom Fields 49? It's not this one. Tom Vernon Field. Let me check that.
Ce avevi la gândit? Holy fucking shit! Wow! Puh! That's a lot of progress. This guy is going to do illustration for D&D for sure within like one year. And this guy started from absolute zero when we were hanging out in the streams to uh, in the, the Discord together. Yeah, yeah, I remember when you refused to go past line drawings. Wow. I need to get back in touch with this guy. Holy shit. Go check Tom Vernon Field on Instagram. This guy started from zero in 2016. Wow. So yeah, don't be passionate about what needs to be done. Be passionate about what will what you will become. I hate doing TikTok. I hate social medias. I hate showing my face on Twitch. I love talking on Twitch, but not showing my face and doxing me. I hate having to do marketing and email address collecting. I hate recording stuff in English with my French baguette accent. The result is what motivates me. The fact that this will become fucking fire. Over time, it will fail. A lot of time, but it will eventually become fucking fire. Uh, then the book is talking about in ignite your purpose, invigorate your soul. So this is all about mastery. If there's something obsessive in your life keeping you awake at night, congratulations, young Skywalker. The force is strong in you. And therein lies the chasm between interest and, uh, or commitment. Shallow desires don't compel sacrifice, whereas a committed purpose sacrifices everything. It borders obsession. Denying the control in your life denies you free-range freedom and plants autonomy and happiness. You can always control what you do and how you think. This is exactly what we talk about with mastery. See how all the books are building on each other and those people don't know each other. Or at least didn't know each other. Now they probably know each other. But they are building on top of each other and they are all saying the same stuff. How to create a business that changed your life. We're just going to talk about that, then we're going to end the stream. And tomorrow we're going to talk deeper about that. But basically... Um, you need to have a need. And then you need to have four commitments. That are governing a principle called a productocracy. There are five core commandments. Frequently referred to sense. The commandment of control. The commandment of entry. The commandment of need. The commandment of scale. And the commandment of time. This is the entire subject of tomorrow. And this is basically introducing the Millionaire Fastlane book. If you answer those five commitments... And of course, if you have good marketing. But if you just answer those five commitments, you have a banger product. And then if you have good marketing, that's how you sell that. But if you want to have a banger product, an absolute hit, you, are, you need to have those five commitments. Control, entry, need, scale, and time. And this creates productocracy. A productocracy pulls money to the value creators. Businesses will grow organically through peer recommendations and repeat customers. Compelled, compelled by a distinguished product or service not, ready, not readily offered elsewhere. This is how you create something unique and a banger. The evidence of heavy advertising signifies an increased probability that a productocracy, 
an incredible tell your friend company is not evident. But this is why there's a lot of shitty products compensating by heavy marketing. Let me give you an example. The Big Mac by McDonald's. It's objectively fucking cancer. It's shit. It tastes good or bad according to your taste. It's not good food. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your stomach, for your mood. It's not something we should eat, basically. Objectively, it's bad for us. So this is a shitty product. But look at the McDonald's advertising. They are fucking heavy. Lots of that. I don't like this music. On the other hand, look at Apple. Of course, they are doing a lot of marketing, but when you are looking at the advertising by Apple, they are super minimalistic. And they are never showing the product. Never. It's always telling a story. That's because they don't need to show the product. Everyone knows what it is. Few people make buying decisions based on advertising. Instead, buying decisions are made through social media, personal recommendations, and peer reviews. Perceived values hustlers are interested in having the best marketing, the best copy, and the best sales funnel, not the best product. If you want to really sell well, if you have a shit product but a good marketing and sales funnel, you will make a lot of money. If you have a shit product and an excellent marketing and sales funnel, you will make millions. Big Mac. If you have an excellent product and shit marketing, you won't sell shit. If you have an excellent product and excellent marketing, that's where you are the next Apple, the next McDonald's, the next Starbucks, the next Spotify, the next YouTube, the next Google. At least in your field, it might not be up to that scale. At least in your field. That's exactly what we're going to talk tomorrow. Tomorrow we are talking business, guys. Almost two hours of stream. Any questions, guys? Anyone want to join the voice chat to talk, to discuss what we talked today? In the meantime, uh, as always, for the YouTube replay, if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to join us on Twitch to discuss with us. Feel free to subscribe on YouTube and on Twitch and follow on, on Twitch. Feel free to drop a comment if you agree or strongly disagree with that and bring new points of view on the table to try to fix those problems. Feel free to join the Discord down below. We are building a crazy good community. Even the books that we are reviewing and how we are talking. We are definitely a bunch of very high achieving people. And if you want to be part of the next big generation of artists, feel free to join. You will contribute to that and have a crazy network once everyone joins the industry in a few years or a few months for some people. If you want to support my work, there is a link down below for donations. You can book some consultations with me too. If you want to talk about your career, your portfolio, environment design, digital painting, 3D, uh, your overall well-being as an artist. I'm not a certified psychologist or whatever, but if you need some kicks in the butt, I can be your guy. If you want just a shoulder to cry on, I'm not your guy. If you want kicks in the butt and a proverb something mind to try to help you, I can be your guy. Anyone have any questions, comments? Stuff like that. Are you enjoying the review of Unscripted, by the way? I know this is a very abrasive and against the grain um, book. And for that, I should have put my faithful hat. Any questions, guys? Not really. <laughs> I, I, I gotta read the book myself. It's a really interesting book that you're uh, covering on the streams. So, like really, really good and informative. Thanks. I have to personally uh, read them and try to digest them and have my, let's say, uh, uh, introspective moment, so to say. Yeah, guess, yeah, sure. It's like you know, every, whenever you read the chapter or page, you have like your own epiphany moments, right? Yeah, yeah. So really good. Yeah, and it's. Uh... Those are books that are, I'm not reading them. I'm always listening them to on on, on Audible, basically. Mm. 
I and uh, that out. yeah yeah because you can walk at the same time you can do that while driving taking the bus or stuff like that so it frees up a bit of time mm -hmm. and uh plus you can listen to them a bit faster if you are able to do that but uh it's very cool to listen to them as an audiobook and you can take notes at the same time too which you can do while reading basically or else you have to pause and stuff like that mm -hmm. and i can show you uh while sharing my my screen but basically what what i do all the time is that i have um i have a software called obsidian i don't know if you know about this mm. let me share my screen also on um on discord there we go yep. and by the way thank you so much for the boost buddy thank you so much hey man no worries i mean how can i not use my boost privileges this server is gonna be a yeah it's it's a uh, it's gonna be so uh yeah. awesome in the future so yeah man use the server because now we can stream it at 60 fps and that's so much cool yeah, on, on this corner yes yes the voice quality is also like a better yeah yeah it's much better so. yeah yeah and basically obsidian is of so is a not taking software it's free by the way and basically you can create pages like that so you are basically having some kind of structures into it and what you can do is you can link you can link stuff by creating if you are doing a bit of coding let's say you you, you see uh i'm typing something mm -hmm. and let's say i have a notion like uh I want to have a link towards the first chapter, like from art school dropout to AAA concept artist. Mm -hmm. I can do a double bracket, and then I have app one. Uh, from art school dropout to concept artist, I have a clickable link, and I can click to it and directly access it. That's very cool. And this is like it's a like visual a mind map, and everything is tied together. Mm -hmm. And then you can link the the different stuff uh, quite efficiently, and creates like a big, big, big mind map of all of your notes. And you can create folders to organize everything. And uh, for now, I'm having uh, different Obsidian files for every every stuff. But you can basically have one big that is basically like a second brain when you can outsource everything. And this is crazy for not taking. Like I have this one for the, the book called Traffic Secret that I'm currently uh, listening to. And every chapter, you can have some uh, some pictures and stuff like that. And it's very good. And every time I put something into brackets right there, it's for my own mentorship and my notes apply to it. So you can organize stuff super, super well. You have a table of contents and you are basically creating your own wiki with that. Really good stuff. Hmm. that's very cool there's a question by Mika I have this project in mind from Young in the beginning it was for making a video game about this project but with time I've changed and wanted to do an animated movie after I changed again I want to do an illustrated novel I just don't know what to do how to manage that I would advise just to make fucking artworks and write about it and this way you are building resources for that you are building visuals and stuff like that you are building your own world you are taking notes about that so you keep building stuff and it's very established in your brain and in your mind. Plus, if you put that on the document, it's kind of outsourced. So you don't have to think about it constantly. You know it's somewhere on your hard drive. And my advice, that's what my mentor told me. My biggest goal, aside from teaching and, and, and mentoring to a lot of people, is to basically build my own game about my owls. So I have a shit ton of documents. Uh... So let me show my screen about my owls. So these ones. I want to create an entire game about that. I want to create a fucking game. And basically my goal, it's it's variable. Again, 10x the stuff. But I want Ori and the Blind Forest and Ori and the Wheel of the Wisps to look like a fucking piece of garbage in comparison. Story-wise, visual-wise, gameplay-wise and stuff like that. I've been writing a lot about the story, about the world building. I have even played a DD and d campaign to, it, to, to try it. And uh, some people managed to cry, me first, while playing it. And, and I've, write, I've been writing about the gameplay and stuff like that, but I, I don't know how to do gameplay and coding and stuff like that. But at least you have the base. And in any case, if you want to make a big project, you would need fucking money. 
And the conclusion I had with that project is that I do not want to ever ask anyone for money to make that project. I don't want any investor on that, whether it's a Kickstarter, because you are signing a pack with the devil and you are always disappointing your public in general, because you are always late, there's not enough money and stuff like that. I don't want to ask the bank for a loan because you are a slave to them and you need to make... And in any case, if you owe someone's money to make a project, the problem is that, in my opinion, you need to think in terms of profitability and not in terms of creativity and your vision. And the problem is that sometimes you have to make com compromises, whether it's cutting some content off or changing the gameplay because it won't sell or whatever. And as I want my vision to be unaltered, my main goal financially, that's what I'm telling all the time my mentor, my long-term goal is to have enough money to buy the development of the game cash without anyone. It would be, in an ideal world, it would be, let's say I have 40 million bucks. I'm going to 40 studio. It's like, hey, here is 40 millions. Make all the assets for me. Then I go to whatever coding, uh, to like Epic Games. It's like, hey, here is 20 million. You have the assets from 40-ish. You have all the animation. Is that together. I'm just a brain. So in any case, you are laying out all the plan, all the writing, all the skeleton, but the execution for that, you need money and you need a team. So in any case, if you want to build a team to make this a reality, you will need fucking money. What you can do is just orchestrate everything from the start. And then the next problem solving, once the project is kind of established, you won't be able to establish everything, but you can establish like 80% of it. And the rest, you will once committed, you will figure out on the fly how to adjust, adjust that. It's basically your next objective is how can I make that a reality and find the fundings for it? This is your next problematic. And as you are finished working on your project already and done everything you could do about the building of it, now all this energy comes back to you and you can focus full time on how can I finance that? And this becomes your next goal. And again, you should not be attached to the process because talking to investors might be fucking shit. But you need to be in love with what you would become and the result of that. That's why you need to 10x the stuff. If you have not watched the, the 10x rule lecture, you need to, to, to see it. It's exactly about that. You need to be attached to the result and to the big, big, big 10x carrot in front of you. That's just my two cents. So write about it. Do everything that you can to plan it as much as you can. Leave space for changes, of course. Leave change for ch for ch this space for, for changes because you never know some idea that you had eight years ago might be irrelevant now and you need to be open to that and you need to be open to people way more specialized than you like game designers, movie makers, sound engineer, gameplay experts willing to give you feedbacks in order to make it better. You need to be willing to accept those feedbacks, of course. And then uh, once you have done all of that, Everything that you cool on your own, the next problematic is to assemble that team. And now you can do that full time because you don't have to think about the project. The project is done in your head. That's just my two cents. Yes, so don't hesitate to use Obsidian and stuff like that uh, to take notes about whatever. Because it's a way to organize your brain so well. So fucking well. Another tool I'm using a lot. It's kind of fun. Let me show that to you. Um, you will laugh at me. But um, I'm using a software called Foundry. This is supposed to be um, a tabletop RPG uh, simulator for online play. So with the the d, &D table that we have on the Discord, we are playing on that. And basically what's going on is that there is a plugin uh, to do journaling into it that is crazy, crazy good and slowly but surely replacing Obsidian for me. Uh, let me show that to you. Give me a sec. Uh, and this is local, by the way. But... Um, so I'm not here to talk about the D&D the &D game and stuff like that. This is some maps and, and shit like that. But there is a journal mod uh, right there. And you can basically create your own wiki. 
So let me show you. You basically have this journal. And every time you create an entry, you can decide if it's a journal entry, a checklist, and then some stuff more specified towards uh, D&D, but you can definitely use them. Uh, otherwise, like checklist, encounter, loot, organization, person, picture, place, point of interest, quest, shop, and slideshow. So like person, you need to, let's say you need to do some research about a company, something like that. You can have your wiki about the different person at the company and have the entire architecture. So let's say you are doing something uh, at, um, let's say you want to apply to, for example, Ubisoft. Let's say you want to apply on, uh, I don't know, on, um, on Assassin's Creed, for example. So what you can do is create a folder. Let's create a folder, a folder, Ubisoft. You create a journal entry within it. Let's say uh, organization or place. Let's just say organization, Ubisoft. Oops. Company. Organization. Okay, the, the new journal entry, you can have an entire description of Ubisoft. And boom, it's, it's within that. You have some notes and stuff like that. You can also create, let's say, um, a place. For the company, if you want more details, so you have see the description, the details. Instead of Townsfall, you can put, you can basically create a sheet, like create an entry for uh, whatever, let's say Rafael Lacoste. A person in the folder Ubisoft. There we go. You have the Rafael Lacoste tab, so you can have a picture of him, some description, some details about him. And what you can do then, is a Ubisoft company in the town folks you drag Ubisoft and you have the role so Rafael Lacos role art director or ex art director location you can put the, the project like uh, Assassin's Creed Prince of Persia when you go there you have the name of the people and the role and you can build like a huge re research bank and wiki about what you are researching for. And this is so important because you need to show the company that you have done research about them. So this is a bit of hacking. The names are kind of weird, but I'm absolutely in love with that plugin. It's free and it's so freaking cool. It's just supposed for to be a wiki for D&D and stuff like that, but you can hack that and use that for note taking for like companies and stuff like that. So I kind of like it. You can create some, uh, let's say you create some kind of, um, in the Ubisoft, you, you create some kind of checklist folder Ubisoft, a new journal. Oh, fuck. Um, uh, to do list. Like uh, my portfolio. To do list checklist you can do either a checklist or a quest log you put that in the folder Ubisoft there we go I can create entries picture one sub okay create entry picture two can create folders. Subject one. And so on and so on. And to organize everything is so freaking cool. <laughs> you can pretty much do the same in Obsidian, but this is more visual for me. And if you want, you can basically convert the, the checklist then into something else. Let's say you, you create a new entry, you create a quest. My portfolio. The Ubisoft. Uh, create a quest follow Ubisoft what you can do in the reward you can create some tabs this can be your goals different steps with the nodes uh, and stuff like that 
This is very this is very nerdy, but I love that tool. I absolutely love that tool. And for the current campaign, I'm building an entire wiki thanks to that. But Obsidian, you can pretty much do the same. I, I, I like the second program because, you know, you mentioned it. It's visual and you can sort of make, a, how can I say, a checklist or a track list, basically. You can add, like, uh, icons on the map, if that's possible, right? And you can sort of uh, oh, yeah, yeah, check yeah. your progress, right? Yeah, so yeah, you, you can do really whatever cool. you want. You can drag then the documents on the map and stuff like that. Really cool. And it, it's it's kind of gamifying the process also because it's it's nerdy. So it's uh, yeah. it's a bit more friendly visually. Yeah than uh, the obsidian that looks very, very uh, cold and professional. <laughs> I like obsidian, uh, I mean, the first program reminds me of uh, Notion. I don't know if... You oh yeah, Notion is the same. You can have the same with Miro too. Yeah. But Notion yeah. is very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm using Notion and I even wrote my uh, 2022 goal uh, list in uh, nice. Notion and sort of have like my reading list, the journal list, something like that so I can actually... Uh, write down my thoughts and goals and stuff like that cool it's, it's a nice program yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I i'll definitely check out those two programs and see if it's gonna match my workflow maybe yeah sure spice it up yeah it looks really cool yeah Thanks yeah for showing that no problem obsidian is very good for not taking at least for me to organize my thoughts i'm not used to it so to organize my thoughts i'm better with foundry but to take notes uh it's so freaking good because you can you can um, drag and drop, you can copy and paste pictures and stuff like that, and you have the editing mode, and then you have the viewing mode. So good. So it's pretty good, and uh, every time I'm taking notes, I'm using that, and I know that my uh, my sister, she's uh, 17 right now, but she's already uh, learning obs Obsidian. I, I told her to already learn that, because really she's going she's going to university next year. And she, she would be using that on like an iPad and stuff like that. And every time she can grab the iPad, take a photo of the, the, the screen and add it to her obsession directly and have like a big journal, very well organized of all everything she's studying. It's like a textbook. Everything is organized and nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't need I, paper and stuff I, like that. And it's very I good. Wish I I started like organizing my things like uh on notion or obsidian and stuff like that like when i started uni or high school because back in high school i was doing it on the old school way using you know uh, writing down on paper and you know it's it, it takes a lot of time and plus it, it costs money because when you buy textbooks or notebooks or stuff like that you know because it, it costs money you know it depends on the country yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know where you're from stuff like that yeah, yeah. but it's really smart that uh you told your sister to do this it's 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 going to build a nice habit then if she does this every single day it's going to be second nature after a year or two yeah yeah, yeah really good yeah it's, it's going to be great I, I i'm i'm still pretty new to obsidian but apparently you can color code stuff when you open the graph you can then isolate with colors and stuff like that to make it easier and there are some crazy guy uh uh note taking that built entire networks of that. Like, look at that. Holy shit, man. <laughs> this, looks like, this looks like a fucking galaxy or like neuron connections. <laughs> it looks like uh, Star Wars uh, sort of uh, galaxy. You know those uh, maps that they show it on shows? Yeah, oh, yeah, like yeah. Hello, Demo. How are you doing, buddy? But yeah, it, it, it's kind of crazy. It's a very nice software and you have crazy links. You, you, can, you can link everything together. There are some nice tutorials. It's very nerdy. It's still very new, so it needs to be refined. But I think within five years, it would become mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, is this uh, going to require like more RAM or video? Uh, no, it, it's super light. It's super it's light. light? Okay, you can, like you, I, you yeah. can you can use it on your smartphone or on your tablet. Hmm. So it's super super light. This kind of stuff is super light. Then that's really useful. I mean, that's it's it's a nice exercise, don't you think? Yeah. You can see everything, and you can also brainstorm and ask you know uh, philosophical or analytical questions and sort of uh, broaden your horizon. It's 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 really cool. Yeah, yeah, and um. And there are some ways to use that, but it's basically called the second brain because technically you should write everything that you think about. Basically, you should start uh, something like... Um, let me open Photoshop. Hmm. 
I'm gonna draw with the with the mouse, but bear with me. No oh, man, don't worry. <laughs> but basically, oh sorry, I went. I was not sharing my screen. But basically, what you could do, um, you know what? Let me grab my tablet. How you should use it is basically, uh, let's say you have your, this is the center point, this is you, so me. Basically, you, you should have a point like uh, out, mm -hmm. uh, money, uh, job, uh, gym. Diet, uh, to do. Technically, you can have everything within one file, and with art, you have I don't know. Let's say with job, you have a uh, CV, letter, mm -hmm. um, portfolio. So indirectly, your portfolio is linked to your art. With art, you have uh, tutorials. And so on and so on. You can build everything about you and your life and all all your organization basically um, in only one file. It's like a second one. And Demo is asking, how can you be lonely when pushing out when you can draw yourself an anime girlfriend? <laughs> this is a fantastic question and I think you brought the answer. Thank you, Bali. I'm gonna remove the tin for hat I'm cooking inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I was wearing that shit demo because we were talking about some uh, pretty unconventional books. It was like uh, Morpheus uh, explaining the Matrix to Neo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Obsidian is pretty cool. Anyways, unless there are other questions, I'm 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 gonna go. Look at this! Look at this! Look at this big guy! <laughs> Anyways, I think I'm gonna stop for tonight. It was pretty long stream, but pretty cool. So tomorrow we are... We we keep going with uh, unscripted by MG DeMarco, uh, and we're gonna talk about the the business aspect of that. So tomorrow we are not talking about art that much. We are talking about how to make money thanks to art. Anyways, thanks a lot, guys. See you tomorrow. Take care.